It strikes me as we're sitting here talking, I don't know why, I mean, I've thought of this before, but it hits me in a new way. In principle, no different than why people buy lottery tickets. There's almost no chance that they will win, but the potential reward they see is so high that they can't help but try. Hello and welcome to Your Business, Your Wealth. My name is Paul Adams. I am the CEO and founder, no longer the president of Sound Financial Group. I've been fired from that role because of Corey Shepard. Corey, <laughs> so glad, as always, that you could be with me. I'm not sure our audience likes when I'm unsupervised, so glad you could be here. Well, now that I know that I, I might fire you from a few other roles inside the organization. I got to go down the list. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's great. I mean, I just just give me like one thing to get really good at. I'd be fine with that. And and the other reason I'm kind of excited about today is the guests that you've been helping, working on, coordinating and arranging to come on with us. Joe Reggio of Dimensional Fund Advisors. Joe, I'm so glad you could be here. Uh, now, yeah, thank you for having me, gentlemen. You, you are welcome. And I think our audience is going to get a great deal out of what you're going to share. Yeah. But before we do, let me just kind of pose the question of the day, if you will, which is, should you be invested in the market? Now, we talk a lot about market investing and this idea that equity returns are one of the best, best wealth building vehicles in the marketplace, easily accessible, nearly everybody can get into the market and you have the ability, even with relatively low amounts of money, you can build an incredibly diverse portfolio. And that doesn't mean you're invested in quote unquote, the market, because the market is what we see on TV. The market is what we see when people talk about the market is up, the market is down. And you're going to notice they're almost always pointing at an individual index or they may be pointing to the performance of some hotshot individual advisor that's out there, whether they're running a mutual fund or a hedge fund and saying, here's what I think is going to happen in the market so that they can trade ahead of it and try to get some additional gains for their mutual fund holders. And what Joe's going to talk to us a little bit about today is where we can see through some of that and see through some of the financial media so that you can get a portfolio that takes the best care of your concerns for the long run. So before we kick off, Joe, could you just share a little bit about you and your career so far, just to kind of give people a little sense of who you are before Corey and I start digging in with a lot of questions? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for having me. Uh, so my name is Joe Reggio. I'm a regional director at Dimensional Fund Advisors where I've been there for the better half of almost a decade. I first started at a large RIA in Century City that introduced me to the ultra high net worth space and dealing with very complex financial situations for clients. I then transitioned to Dimensional where I started off as an associate and then worked my way up to become a regional director. And my main role at Dimensional, I focus on three areas. So it's gonna be investments, messaging and business strategy with firms like Sound Financial. Right on. And one thing that we talk a fair amount about inside of Sound Financial Group is that when it comes to most mutual funds that are out there really marketing themselves to the end consumer or to the advisor, Dimensional's really different that way, that they don't necessarily go out and just knock on the doors or cold call a bunch of advisors uh, mm -hmm. I've been to your events where it's like, here's an intro to dimensional funds. And there's a bunch of advisors in the room, not currently using dimensional. But the thing that's always kind of astounded me is that everybody pays their way to go. They're paying their own flights, their own hotel, all of that. And they still come to show up to hear from dimensional. Whereas many of these other fund companies will come and bring a great deal of effort to bring people in to an event that they finance or pay for or fly people out to, maybe just to kick off, because we talk with clients about that all the time. From your experience, why is it advisors are who are in the Dimensional Funds platform choose to go to events that are not paid for to go and learn? 
It's a unique situation in the industry, undoubtedly. The thing that I do love about our business model is that we understand our way of viewing markets isn't for everyone, right? It tends to be those who have some sort of intellectual curiosity to understand how could we potentially take the best and greatest ideas from financial science and academia and implement that into real world portfolios. And that's the expertise that Dimensional brings. So a lot of advisors, well, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but there are advisors out there that tend to invest their clients' money in a more conventional man, uh, conventional way. And that conventional way is trying to forecast where markets are going, pick individual stocks, or time the market. Those are what we view as unnecessary aspects to have it a successful investment journey. So instead of trying to forecast, pick stocks, time the markets, what Dimensional does is lean on the greatest ideas in academia and bring that to life for clients. So there's a distinction in the way that we view markets and how a majority of money is invested in this world to view markets and what clients hear from the financial media about how the best way that they should uh, grow their wealth over time is a very different perspective. You know, Joe, when I introduce clients to DFA, a lot of times I'm saying something like, well, they, they're the biggest mutual fund company you've never heard of mm -hmm. because, because of how you just play differently than so much the industry. And one of the questions I get a lot is, you know, clients who are into this style of, of investing are usually already familiar with ETFs and index investing. Could you could you open up the conversation by just telling us a little bit about why DFA picks a mutual fund structure rather than diving into that ETF world like a lot of firms have? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's helpful to take a historical look at this. And what I mean by that is if you go back into the 1950s or so, there wasn't enough computing power to provide individuals with an understanding of what's the long term average rate of return for the U.S. market. So that, I mean, you go back to 1602 when the Dutch East India Trading Company was the first stock that was ever issued, right? So from then until about the 1950s, there's no understanding of what's the long-term average rate of return for the stock market. So what academia and others helped provide was with the help of computing power was to find out what is that average rate of return. And so you could think of that as an index, right? It's the average rate of return for the U.S. stock market, which is now roughly about 10%. Which, which so long way, I, I hate to interrupt you, Joe, but I have got to say something. It's just imagine that literally before the 1940s or 50s, you just found a stock and bought it hoping all would go well because mm -hmm. you didn't have any data on long-term asset performance until the 40s, 50s, 60s, as some of that was able to start coming out. I mean, that that is like the most yeah. elusive, obvious thing that most people miss. So I, I hated to interrupt mm -hmm. you there, but I just had to put a pin in that because I think we could probably do a whole episode of how people invested in yeah. the 19, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that most investors would access the market, right? They'd find a broker, the broker would pick stocks, they'd charge a high commission for doing this service, and then the investor was left with a small handful of stocks, having no clue whether or not the return that they had from their basket of stocks was better or worse than just the average return of the entire market. So as I was saying, with the um, advent of a computing power, we were able to find out what the long-term rate of return was. And lo and behold, we find that the average rate of return was doing substantially better than all those brokers out there who were charging lots of money for only picking a handful of stocks. So that was almost the genesis of the index fund world. So then you fast forward to where we are today and ETFs have exploded. And for the everyday investor, that is fantastic. They have an opportunity now to get a globally diversified, low cost portfolio that on uh, that actually outperforms the vast majority of active managers. And that is a huge benefit to them. So I would never say anything bad about ETFs. I just know that what we do at Dimensional is a step forward. Right? You can think of 
day one as being stock pickers, day two as being index funds, and then now day three is a dimensional approach where we we look like an index fund. We're very diversified. We have very low costs. We have very low turnover, very tax efficient vehicles. But the way that we differ from ETFs is that we have the ability day in and day out to keenly focus on an asset class and make sure that we're delivering that asset class day in and day out for the advisors. So when then they build a portfolio for their clients, they have the tools necessary to meet their clients' long-term objectives. Well, and, and now you touched on indexing there a little bit and ETFs. And there's this, this idea that some people say, well, I just buy the index because it gives me a pure allocation to say small cap value, or it gives me a pure allocation mm -hmm. to you know, some small cap uh, international. And one thing that I've noticed is that there, there are some problems, if you will, inside of both indexes and ETFs. One is reconstitution cost, and the other being that ETFs have to give this daily reporting of all of their underlying securities, which can damage their capacity to really trade and be effective in the market. Can you talk a little bit about the reconstitution cost and that, that like it's kind of funny, it's actually a problem that that transparency mm -hmm. causes? Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about an index fund, what is what's the index funds manager's goal? Their goal is zero tracking error. And what I mean by that is that you have an organization like the S&P, right? Standard and Poor's. They send out a list to the all the index managers who are tracking the S&P 500. So they say, team, here are the 500 stocks that you need to hold and the precise weights you need to hold them at to match the index. Now the fund managers say, okay, I know exactly day in, day out what uh, stocks I need to hold and the precise weights. So they have very uh, rigid mandate in order to meet their goal of zero tracking error. For dimensional, we provide flexibility to an asset class. We are not beholden to any index manager telling us, or excuse me, any index company telling us what stocks we have to hold day in and day out. What dimensional does is Let's look at the, we'll design the asset class ourselves. And then we, we make sure that we have lots of other filters in place, meaning we'll, we'll screen for momentum, we'll screen for companies that actually have lower expected returns in that asset class. But the big picture here is that we're able to use flexibility and substitutability between stocks in order to actively capture the asset class where an index fund has a much more mechanical, rigid way of allocating their dollars. Well, and when they have to do that, most of these indexes, right, they'll they'll release, here's what we're changing the index, some days prior before it's <clears throat> actually supposed to change, and therefore mm -hmm. can increase the cost of putting those positions back in the portfolio. Is yes. it, can you talk yeah. a little bit about how that reconstitution cost creates that uh, almost like an unseen cost to many of the index investors. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens is the index has a reconstitution date. Let's t hypothetically say at the end of June, that's when they're going to reconstitute or refresh that list of stocks. All of the managers that are following them need a heads up. So generally speaking, the index provider says, okay, we'll give you 30 days notice what the new list is going to be and the precise weights. Well, what do you think happens during that 30 day window? Right. Every the flash stocks, trader in the country buys those stocks ahead of time because they know there's going to yeah. be an open market for them in 30 days. Well, because there's yeah. thousands of index managers trying to achieve no tracking error, all going right. after those. Yeah. Right. And they know the precise day and time that they need to have those weights. And so what you see is that the volume slowly starts to creep up until reconstitution date. And when it hits reconstitution date, the, the volume of trading in those stocks exponentially gets larger. So what Dimensional does is says, let's avoid that price pressure. And let's avoid those kind of hidden costs of, of, of having to be in specific names at specific times. So that's one, one aspect about index funds that, that um, can, can be a little bit detrimental because you're increasing the cost during those times. The other thing that's really important to remember is that with 
any asset class, you could take the S&P 500. It's a very small subset of stocks in that list that actually drives the overall performance. So if you think about last year, the S&P was up about 32, 33%. Not every stock returned 32 or 33%, right? There was a very uh, dispersed range of returns. So if you're not there capturing the high flyers, you're not gonna get that average rate of return. So that part is very important to us at Dimensional because with an index fund, they are only looking at a refresh list once, maybe twice a year. At Dimensional, we're doing it day in and day out. And an example of that is in 2006, when President Trump was elected. Going into that election, there was a lot of belief that Hillary Clinton was gonna win. As soon as President Trump won, and I'm not making any political statements here whatsoever, but when he won, what we saw was from the time of the election results until the end of the year, the small cap stocks in the United States exponentially shot the lights out. And going into the election, they were basically neck and neck with large companies. And by the end of the year, you saw small caps outperform large by more than 6% over just that four or five week period. Wow. And so if you're not there to capture that excess return, you're going to be missing out on a lot because if you're an index, they, ref they re uh, refresh their list back in June. So that was, you know, six months ago where you're not going to be able to capture all of those returns that happen very quickly. Now, you, you have a pretty good little analogy for that drift that occurs that people have the small mm -hmm. caps, some become large caps or medium caps like they, they get acquired by somebody else. And because that index list stays the same, people kind of float out of the range that they're supposed to be in. But you you have like a simple story that kind of explains that you shared with Corey and I earlier. Yeah. So if you think about a, if you're gonna take a flight, so I live in Los Angeles and I'm on, in our Santa Monica office. And if I go to LAX and I'm going to take a trip to New York, would I want my uh, pilot to be looking at the weather report in Los Angeles today and then not looking at the weather report for the rest of the duration until he lands, he or she lands in New York? Probably not, right? I want up-to-date information during that entire journey. And that's very similar to an index fund that says, here are the holdings of this asset class as of the end of June. And now we're going to wait six months until we refresh what that asset class looks like. To us, we think that, there, that, we think that there's a better way to go about capturing that asset class. And that's why we do not behold ourselves to an, a list that an index provider uh, gives. We say we should be able to design our own universe and then keenly focus on those groups of, uh, that group of stocks day in and day out. That is, that's one of my favorite distinctions about dimensional that, you know, a pure passive portfolio is drifting all the time. It's not active management, but it's actively staying inside of a prudent structure. And mm -hmm. I really, I really like that. So, uh, we're going to, this has been a lot of great material so far, uh, a lot of great analogies and info for our, our listeners. We're going to take a quick commercial break and a message from Sound Financial Group. And when we come back, we're going to dig into some, some more uh, results of the computing power that Joe mentioned and what we've been able to figure out and notice about what's happened over the market for the long term. So stay with us. Paul Adams here at Sound Financial Group. Are you curious what you can accomplish with our help? You're here enjoying the show. Our philosophy is helping you increase your effectiveness with money. And now we have a way to help you take another step on your financial journey. We have designed a financial inquiry call for you and the thousands of other listeners of your business, your wealth. This is a complimentary 15 minute conversation where one of our team members will ask you some key questions, understand your concerns, and if appropriate, schedule a time for further conversation with an advisor. If you look at the episode description, you'll see a link to schedule a call at a time that's least invasive for you. And even if now's not the right time for us to work together, we'll point you toward resources to help you in your financial journey. We always look forward to connecting with our listeners and we look forward to talking with you soon. Welcome back to Your Business, Your Wealth. We're here with our guest, Joe Reggio from Dimensional Fund Advisors. So, 
Joe, before the break, we were talking a little bit about pre 1950s, the style of investing people would do is, you know, buy whatever stocks their broker recommended and hope that that small, small pile worked well for them because they had some info that no one else had. And, and now, you know, people, even though we have computer power at work for us, it's that pre 1950s style still lives on for a lot of people. So we've got active investing and active stock picking. We've got passive indexing and dimensionals, neither of those. It's something different. So could you talk about that, how dimensional is different than both an active and a passive indexing strategy? Yeah. So what dimensional and again, it'd probably be self-serving since I do work at dimensional to say this, but I believe we take the best of both worlds. We are, our goal unquestionably is outperformance. We are trying to beat benchmarks on a daily basis. What's, and that's very similar to active management. And we're very similar to indexing because our portfolios hold a very large number of companies. And we try and make, we try and control what we can control, which is keeping our costs low, making sure they're as tax efficient as possible while still aiming to have that goal of outperformance. So you're blending the two in a sense. Now, active managers, which is how a, a majority of money is invested around the world, have a very difficult time outperforming benchmarks or the average return of the market. And so you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? Why do active managers have such a difficult time? And it really comes down to this notion that capital markets and the securities within those markets reflect available information almost instantaneously. And an example of that is looking at March of 2020, right? Right when the uh, COVID pandemic was really catching a lot of legs, what you saw was a very steep drop in stock prices. And why that happened is because there was so much more uncertainty about the future. And prices in any market, <clears throat> any public market are forward looking meaning that the prices had such a steep drop because the expectation is that there are going to be lower revenue for these companies, lower profits. So the so stock, price, um, stock prices drop. If you're an active manager, I would put good money on the fact that you didn't have a COVID pandemic game plan in your forecast. No COVID screen built in. No the, COVID no, screen. Yeah. <laughs> So it's very difficult for, and what this boils down to is the difficulty active managers have in forecasting what's going to happen next. Uncertainty is the only certainty. If anyone thinks they can tell you what the outcome is going to be tomorrow, a week from now, a year from now, that's a fallacy. So active managers, although there are some that can do it to distinguish whether or not they were lucky or they were skillful is a whole nother conversation we could say for another day. So bottom line is that active managers have a very difficult time outperforming markets. Index funds, again, give you the average rate of an asset class of an entire market or of the, the global uh, stock market. And on average, they do better than a vast majority of active managers. And in and, a sense, that's exactly what you can see on the slide. So Corey, if you like, would you like me to describe? Uh, yeah, okay. please do, for because there's folks watching on video, but then there's some folks driving around in their car, listening on the podcast. So <laughs> give them a sense of what we're looking at here. Okay, fantastic. Well, what we have here is a slide from our annual mutual fund landscape. And what we do is take at the end of every year, we'll look at all the actively traded mutual funds in the United States. And one of the key aspects when you're evaluating performance is to make sure that you are you have a survivorship biased free data set. And what I mean by that is that you can't only look at those funds that started 10, 15, 20 years ago and, and look at the results of those that are still in existence today. You need to account for those that have closed up shop along the way to give you a true sense of, of how well these stock or how well these mutual funds have performed over time. And so what we see here is, oh, and go ahead. I, and I'm with you. I, I'm looking at this is like, if I we don't, I mean, for those of you listening, we'll, I'll just kind of read off these ten year numbers. But it's like three thousand funds assessed over ten years. Fifty nine percent were still open. Let me just say that again: five nine percent were still open at the end of a decade. 
Just 10 years. Barely better than a coin flip. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of that, only 21% beat their benchmarks. So for all of you listening, uh, put that in perspective, only 21% of all the managers you could have selected 10 years ago would have beat the benchmark. So if you had a portfolio with 10 different funds, two of them outperformed their benchmark. And Joe, how well could we predict which manager would have been the ones that outperformed? Not very well is the short answer. Well, and I think uh, you gave us some data on that. I'm just going to see if I can click through to the next one. Mm -hmm. Kind of walk us through what what this is sharing with us. And for those of you watching, we're looking at a graph or listening. Those We are looking at a graphic that is only assessing which asset managers for the previous five years performed in the top 25% of all the other managers they're being compared to against their indexes. So Joel, I'll have you take it from there. Yeah, so thank you, Paul. What we saw on the previous slide was looking at a very low number of managers were able to survive a 10 year period and then actually outperform, right? It's like roughly that 20%. So then some investors will say, well, why don't I just focus on the winners? Those that have the impressive track record. Which, right? which that does make sense. Like yeah. if I'm hiring an employee, I it. want somebody who's successful before. Corey doesn't let me hire people. If I think I can turn <laughs> chicken crap into chicken salad, that's why Corey's in the organization to stop me from having this grand vision of how well people are going to do. But you would hire people that way. You might hire a vendor that way for your organization. But why doesn't that apply to these managers that performed well in the past? Yeah, that's the disconnect from the you know our everyday life and compared to the financial markets right you would look for a doctor a mechanic um a florist that has an impressive track record and has good reviews so that's how a lot of individuals look at their investments they say well let's look at the morning star rankings if it has five stars it must be a great fund or what you see on this slide is let's give a manager five years and if they can demonstrate over a five-year time frame that they are the top 25% of their category, I think that's a pretty good indication that they should continue that outperformance. That is but, so reasonable and common sense, but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I laugh, but it's a sad, it's a sad reality. Uh, you look at that top 25% of performers. So after five years, Let's just see how well they do one year after that great track record. So we're not even beating them up. We're not saying, how'd you do over the next five or 10 years? This is just one year after they had five years Correct. of success. Correct. And we've been doing this study for well over a decade now. And what we see is that those that were in the top 25% over the five-year period, you move forward one year and only 25% of those remain in that top quintile. So very dismal results. Wow. Yeah. It's like almost like it's random. They sure looks that way. Mm -hmm. If I only select the top 25% and then assess them over the next year and on average, only 25% of them outperform on average, it's like it almost goes back to the thing that we learned in Econ 101, which is the monkey throwing the darts can outperform mm -hmm. many active managers. And that's mm -hmm. why I want to roll out to our audience, our new monkey dart throwing fund. <laughs> we are going to just employ one really sharp chimpanzee. He doesn't know sign language. Uh, and, but the good news is he doesn't bite and he knows how to throw darts. So that's going to be our new strategy. Thank you all so much for being just. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now we've, We've only selected the active managers. So now I want to take and transition us back to this idea of indexing. And the idea mm -hmm. being that I'm going to own, quote unquote, the market. My emotions may be driven based upon what I see on the news or what I read in the Financial Times of some sort. What, what are we seeing? Uh, you know, I see this slide that's showing like a 10-year span of the Stand Standards & Poor's 500 and people talk about the lost decade. Is that what we're seeing here in the Standards of Poor's 500? 
Yes, this is the lost decade, which many refer to as the period from January 2000 until the December 2009 timeframe. And over that 10 year timeframe, if you actually gave your capital to the largest, most mighty companies in the United States that are represented in the S&P 500, you actually would have lost money during that 10 year timeframe. And what many don't know is that this actually can be expanded out to 2012. So then you go from 2000 to 2012, 13 year timeframe where the mighty S&P 500 trailed one month T-bills, which is arguably the safest investment in the world. So that's a 13 year time frame where if I'm providing my capital to these large companies, I actually would have been better off in a much safer, higher quality investment than these huge companies. Despite and I love report. this series, this these next three. Oh, well, we're, you know, looking at how I think a lot of investors use short term data for long term planning. And that's a mm -hmm. that's a fallacy right right there, <laughs> and so this it's it's one of those is like, that the, the logic would of be like there except my kid is always willing to talk in large crowds, so therefore they're going to be a public speaker. Like I just take this short term data <laughs> of a four year old and I'm like <laughs> get him on the fast track on stage. That's true. That's true. So Joe, could you walk us through these the the narrative of these next slides uh, the two thousands the 2010s, and then that whole 20 year period and, and the range of results we've seen from the S&P. Thanks, Corey. So what we're seeing on this slide now is saying, okay, we've gone past that first decade of the 2000s. Now let's look at 2010 to 2019 and how well have these asset classes performed? What we see is that the large US corporations as represented by the S&P 500 index did very well. When you look at it compared to these other asset classes, it actually did the best during that time frame. So that's probably a lot of what your listeners have been hearing over the last few years is that why would I want to be in anything but the S&P 500? It's big, well-known companies. It's all the names that we use on a daily basis. It's the Netflix, Googles, Facebooks of the world. Why would I want to be an invest in anything else? Well, if you expand this time frame into the next slide, what you see is that even though the S&P 500 did the best on a relative basis during that 2010 to 2019 timeframe, if you look at the full period, two decades in combination from 2000 to 2019, what we see is even though the S&P 500 stocks did the best that second half, that second decade, over the full time period, they still provided the least positive returns compared to the other asset classes. So it's really good for investors to take a step back and look at the full time frame and realize that, you know what? Diversification is my friend. I need to utilize it to be globally exposed to and reap rewards no matter where they occur in order for me to increase my financial well-being and have a more successful investment journey. And you know, the story that I see here even bigger behind these three slides is that you know, Paul, if you can go back to the earliest, the earliest time period, the biggest down, the biggest negative pressure on the S and P during this 2000 to 2009 happened towards the end of this period. We all know that 2008 was the, the biggest drop. So people were still coming into the S and P probably earlier in the decade. And so they're before the down and then in the next 10 years that we had the best performance, they were slowly coming back in. So they probably didn't even capture all of that, you know, upswing performance. So when we look at that whole 20 year period, even though the S and P itself did 6.1, mm -hmm. the average investor probably didn't even get that much because of the times that they were coming in and out over that time period. So it's like a, it's like a double, negative because they're they're staying concentrated and timing at the same time so they're coming in on the front end of the downturn and the tail end of the upswing whoa say that again i know right that was great <laughs> the, the front end they're coming in at the front end of the downturn and the tail end of the upswing yeah well and, and joe you know we kind of kicked off this episode with the question 
And that's kind of where I think would be a good place to wrap today is that perhaps you shouldn't be invested in, quote unquote, the market. And I'm using that term, the market, to be what they're constantly talking about on TV, what they're constantly talking about in the news or on the articles you read online. And that it's the market, which usually ends up as an index that, as we talked about earlier, drifts throughout the year and then gets reset. And we lose some efficiency in that reset, coupled with the fact that we're not rebalancing to any other asset classes. We show our clients often that they'll say, well, but the S&P 500 was great or flat or whatever the thing is that they're being, I would go as far as say indoctrinated into thinking that your investment portfolio performance is the same as what you see on the news. Instead of that rebalancing that occurs over time where you see that negative S&P 500 performance But if you just had a 70% stock, 30% bond portfolio that rebalanced every year, you actually got tremendous performance over that same period of time. Mm -hmm. My my question to you is, why do you think, and this, I know this is just an opinion, but just to trigger some thinking for people, why is it you think that people are so attracted to tracking what it is that they see in the news or tracking what they see you know, uh, in the financial times or in the articles or whatever the is out in the zeitgeist and the common narratives in society. Why is it people are so attracted to that? And it's difficult for them to both build, rebalance and be patient with an academically allocated, globally diversified portfolio. I think it's, I think it's most alluring to investors because they can reap really big rewards if they are correct. And it's mm-hmm. a simple way for people. They, a lot of times, individuals look for an easy way to achieve something. And they think that if they listen to CNBC or any financial media for that matter, that these experts will give them the insight that they need to get rich quick. And all of us that have been studying finance, understanding the inner workings of markets, know that There's no get rich scheme, get rich quick scheme with investing. You need to focus on your fundamental principles as an investor to increase the odds of a successful journey. It doesn't guarantee anything, but what Sound Financial does along with other really good advisors is they design a portfolio for the client that can increase the odds of them having a successful journey, outperforming benchmarks and meeting their financial goals. Those who don't have a financial advisor end up trading at the worst possible times. And it's very similar to what we've seen recently with the coronavirus. You see a sharp decline in prices. Individuals get the feeling that they can't stomach it anymore. They have to get out. And what ends up happening is they end up selling at the lows and waiting for a green flag for when they should get back in the markets. And what all that leads them to doing is selling low and buying high which is the opposite of what you need to do to grow your wealth prudently over time. It strikes me as we're sitting here talking, I don't know why, I mean, I've thought of this before, but it hits me in a new way. In principle, no different than why people buy lottery tickets. There's almost no chance that they will win, but the potential reward they see is so high that they can't help but try. Mm -hmm. I think the big difference is that one lottery ticket every now and then is five to I don't even it's like you know a gallon of milk I don't really know what it costs I don't buy it myself <laughs> but whatever that cost is very low compared to playing that lottery game with your life's assets and your life's work it's a very different risk reward proposition Joe thank you so much for for coming on this has been an amazing treat we know that you all Indeed. are super busy over at dimensional and and we are very grateful for you taking the time to to spend with us uh, Paul any other any final thoughts Yeah, just for all of our listeners, here's what I'd like everybody just to be able to take away from Joe today to really focus on. One is that there is a bunch of financial noise. You know, as we record this, we're in the midst of lockdowns and shelter in place that are probably easing by the time you guys listen to this. That there's all kinds of prevalent conversation around the performance of a particular index or some commodity like oil or gold or whatever. And what Joe is communicating to us today is that the game is not 
how do I make a good bet today to place that bet on the table to hope that it hits my number and I come out with a significant amount of money? That is by definition speculation and gambling. But if what you can do instead is take a disciplined approach to be able to achieve a little bit better return, not a lot. When Joe talks about outperformance, we're not talking about crushing the market. We're talking about getting enough little extra performance to be able to pay for having good coaching like our team. And I want to encourage anybody out there listening that if you're in the position right now, and we're going to extend this through the end of COVID, that while we do have our full wealth design build process and and a way that we advise people on all areas of things financial to help them be more efficient at meeting what their aims are for the future, we also periodically offer a portfolio review, $500, and it's meant to be able to do the review and give you asset allocation you could go implement on your own, or you could explore implementing that with us. We are waiving any cost throughout the end of this COVID crisis to help people make sure their asset allocation, even if it's in your 401k or money we will never manage, we will give you a portfolio allocation wherever your investments are now so that you have the greatest likelihood of being able to get back what the market has gone down so that you don't panic or freak out and go to cash and miss what will one day be a resurgence of this market and thereby you actually locked in your losses. If there's anything we can do to assist you in being a better investor, we want to come alongside you, especially in this time, so that you get the opportunity to have the future that you and your family want. And as always, from myself, from Corey, from Jordan, our video engineer, from Joe Riccio, from Dimensional Funds, and from all of our staff, we hope that this has been a contribution to you being able to design and build a good life. Hey guys, so glad you could tune in and watch that video. I want to remind you to subscribe, be sure to hit the notification bell so you can get the latest piece of financial knowledge we release. And don't forget, go to Amazon, get a copy of Sound Financial Advice. Why? Because it'll make you better looking and smarter.